Welcome. My name is Deepak Aburi. I lead the enterprise data platforms at Amgen. Along with me sharing the stage is Vicky Jain, principal from ZS and also one of our strategic partners. Well, thank you for being here today. And we're excited to share our story, our journey for enterprise platforms for the past few years. First things first, who are we? For those of you who do not know who Amgen is, Amgen is one of the leading biotech companies. We have about 25 products globally. We have and continue to impact millions of lives across the globe. Let me start this story by telling you when the journey began and why the journey was necessary for us. Back in 2018, Amgen decided to invest heavily in data capabilities across the business. What you see up here on the slide are really different functions within a drug life cycle process. We begin with research, followed by clinical trials, then manufacturing at scale, and finally taking the drugs to patients at scale through commercialization process. If you think about it for a moment, data is not just at the core of each of those functions, but it is also unique and complex in different ways across those functions. Let me give you an example. In the research space, a lot of innovation has been and is continued to happen there. Things like in silico drug development and design, human genomics, all of these deal with massive amounts of data. Well, when it comes to even the analytics in this space, it's quite unique. Traditional BI tools do not work here. Special scientific analysis plugins are required on top of the visualization tools. Similarly, if you look into the trials, we deal with lots of uh, patient data, very secured patient data. It also involves lots of unstructured data by looking into uh, publications externally. Well, we also have third-party integrations that, require, that is required for cohort analysis. All of these require very specialized solutions in each of these areas. You get the point. The point is, each of these areas have unique needs and complexities when it comes to data and analytics. Every one of those four functions is quite different. Data was and is complex for each of these. Now, not just complexity, data is also siloed across these functions. When a guy or a girl from commercial wants access to data into the clinical side, it often takes hoops for them to get to it. Just get to it get the right access to that data. Data is extremely fragmented. That is how we were back in 2018. Now, the technology wasn't helping either. There were just way too many choices. If it was not way too many choices, it was complex. If not complex, it was ex expensive. We all know this story, right? It wasn't helping. So all of these complexities made us really get together and sit down in a room and come up with a strategy it's a rather simple strategy that we fondly named data city plan. When you start building a new city, you start with strong foundations, right? Similarly, we said, let's actually start with building strong enterprise platforms to begin with as the foundational layer. Then we said, let's get into building data as reusable, durable assets connected across the enterprise so that building analytical solutions can be accelerated at scale for the entire business. Rather simple strategy, like I said, makes sense. Let's double click a little bit more into that. As part of the strategy back then, we made few strategic choices, key strategic choices. The first one we said, let's go big, let's, go, let's invest big in fewer technologies. We chose AWS as our cloud strategy. We went to Databricks for data engineering and Tableau for visualization and so on. We bet big on fewer technologies. The second strategy we said is let's grow engineering talent, both internally and externally through selective strategic partnerships. Oh, sorry. The third one we said is we wanted to transform ourselves. We wanted to transform how we delivered solutions. We completely believed in the promise of agile. We completely believed in the promise of building quick, iteratively, and failing fast if need to. And the last one is enterprise data platforms. Last but not the least, what we said is we do need custom, fit to purpose, Amgen technology platforms focusing in fewer areas. And let me touch very briefly on what those fewer areas are, and we'll talk through the journey here. 
Number one, connected data. We wanted a technology, a platform that would actually host all the data connected across the enterprise. That's a loaded term, right? But that's what, that's what our, that was our strategy at that point. And I'll walk you through what happened through the timeline a little bit. The second thing we wanted to do is data visualization. We wanted a solid technology for data visualization. Number three, that was also the time when data science was starting to pick up at Amgen. We wanted to provide a one-stop shop for our data scientists to maximize what they can do and they are, do it, they are the best. And the last but not the least is unstructured data. This was an interesting one. We just knew we had a lot of unstructured data to get to. We knew the insights were just not enough on the unstructured data. We didn't know what we had to do, but we just knew we wanted to solve it. And we marched forward with those strategic choices. Now let's take a look at the timeline, right? So this wasn't a one day match. So it was a journey for the past four years and it continues to be a journey for us. By far, the biggest focus area in our space is connected data. It all started back when we had our data lake on Hadoop. It was well used in a couple of areas. Well received, well utilized, but we quickly realized the, the uh, limitations of that solution. We couldn't scale it out. We couldn't scale it out to other solutions, other, in other functions. And it didn't take us too long to realize that the way to go is data lake on cloud. That's when we marched on to AWS and Databricks back in 18. Our first solution for data lake on cloud was back in 2018. It quickly, it was well received by all the business functions. We started adding more and more data sets. Didn't take us too long. It was a huge success. That led to another problem. We just, had, we just started getting way too much data. We didn't know what's on there now, how to find it. We also didn't know how best to actually manage it and govern it. And more importantly, manage the access to those data assets. That actually gave birth to another platform within our own ecosystem that, we call, that, that is our enterprise marketplace. That does three things. Help discover the data, help create the data, and help manage access to the data. In healthcare, in a regulated environment, managing access is a big thing. So that, was, that went well. A few years down the lane, we started realizing, well, we got all the data together on the data lake, but it still not, is not connected the way we want it. it is, something was still missing in that connected data. That led us to introduce a semantic layer to define the relationships between those data assets. Also introduce graph technology so that those relationships between those data assets is more prominent. That is where our data lake started evolving into a data fabric. And lastly, we also introduced data governance practices so that we can actually mature the organization in terms of data ownership and data stewardship. That is by far our biggest focus, connected data in our enterprise platform strategy. Now let's take a look at the next journey, data visualization. The problem here is not that we didn't know the right technology to use, but we just had way too many technologies to use. If I'm not mistaken, I think we had about eight technologies back in the day eight visualization technologies in our ecosystem. Well, you might think that, hey, if you have eight, it's easy. Pick one and get rid of the other seven. You're wrong. We found out the hard way that it's actually harder to deprecate a technology, a legacy technology, than to actually introduce a new one. At this point, I'd say we're about three and a half. Three and a half because we're actively working on the fourth one to be retired. The next thing is the data science. We have a wide array of data scientist communities within each of the functions. The technologies that we use predominantly are R Shiny, SAS, and also Databricks. We had a few different technologies that we use today. We are actively, and this evolution is continuing to grow, we're actively trying to build a platform on top of each of these technologies so that it actually makes it easier for our data scientists to procure access to data, procure compute layer on whichever technology they need. Also, in some cases, custom solutions where we are starting to consider building a container service in AKS to actually enable that. And we'll, we'll double click in some of these in a little bit uh, of the presentation. So the last part of the journey here is unstructured data. Like I said, this was an interesting journey. It took us a little while to realize what is the maximum ROI that we can get in a use case here. We figured out where that lies is really being able to give our biggest knowledge workers, which is all of the staff at Amgen, access to some of our largest unstructured knowledge repositories. So then came out the solution called Enterprise Search. We built an Enterprise Search solution. 
on AWS using Solar as our data store, integrated into our intranet portal that opened up the access to all our, all our staff, all FTEs as well as contract workers according to their roles in a, in a controlled and governed manner. I'm gonna underline that and repeat that. Controlled and governed manner. That was very important for us when we opened the gates on our unstructured data. It is well received today and we are now exploring ways to actually bring in more content across the board into our enterprise search, as well as enhance the user experience through uh, virtual assistance and you know, con conversational uh, aspects to it. So this on the whole is a journey of how our enterprise platforms evolved over the past four years and we continue to evolve. When it comes to the structured data, we have completely seen the value of connecting all the data assets in the enterprise in selective areas in our, connect, in our connected data ecosystem. Now we are actively marching towards connecting more dots in the enterprise and reaping more benefits for that. None of this would have been possible if we were just operating the way we did back in, back in the day, which is as project teams. We would not have been able to deliver what we, what we did. So there's more to this story beyond technology. We also had to evolve ourselves and how we operate. This is where our focus, our strategic choices of agile delivery comes in. We transformed ourselves to operate as a full-blown product engineering organization in a scaled fashion. We are using safe methodologies. That has tremendously helped us be, be able to get to where we are today in the past four years. Now this is a component architectural view. What you see, what see, uh, what you see out here is basically the uh, few different platforms that I mentioned, all of them sitting in the same AWS VPC, all of them uh, modular in fashion, which is one of the key things that we wanted to do, keep them modular so that it could actually be replaced where we needed, uh, interconnected, interoperable, and giving a unique uh, experience for all our users across the enterprise. So that was very important for us. I'm gonna speed things up a little bit. Now four years down the lane, where are we? Our enterprise platforms are very well accepted across the enterprise, across the, across the users between different functions. We have over 5,000 data sources ingested and about half a million data assets curated and in our catalog. Well, the, the, the better metric to highlight here is what used to take hoops to get access to the data from a different function now can take less than eight hours to find your data asset, put in a request to get access to the data, and get approved by the, by the right data owner for that data asset. Less than eight hours. That's big. And we're on a journey to connect more dots to actually get all of the enterprise data there. Visualization, more than 20,000 users. Search has been tremendously successful. One other metric that's really uh, key here is our DevOps maturity score, something by that you know, we made it ourselves. Vicky is gonna touch upon that a little bit uh, in, a little, in a very little while. Mm. So let me speak a little bit upon what, we have, what have we learned in this journey so far. The number one big thing is talent. Our teams are our biggest assets. Our investment in the talent paid us very well. And where we are today is completely because of that. Second one is user engagement and adoption metrics. There is often uh, 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 an aspect that is overlooked when you're building enterprise solutions. There's way too much focus on the engineering side. We got to actually keep an eye and pulse on are they being leveraged, adopted? So we heavily forced ourselves in being able to do that. We engage actively with our user community today, listen to them, and make sure we're building the right products, even if it is fewer products and fewer features. That has helped us in the adoption tremendously. Next one, fewer, bigger technology bits I mentioned, that paid well. We had our failures, but our agility, which is the next one here, helped us walk back on those failures. We failed fast and we realized and we walked back. So that has paid us really, really well. Last one's focus on TCO. It is very easy to lose, fo lose focus on this as we accelerate and speed in innovation and delivery. We often forget that cost engineering is super critical. So we force ourselves, and the way we force ourselves is every quarter, every PI, as we work, we try to balance reliability and cost ownership and things like that into what we work on and how much time we spend on it. That is super important so that you don't lose the focus of the value, total value. Well, a quick moment before I hand it over to my friend here. This is the moment of shameless you know, promotion from me here. <laughs> we are looking, Amgen's looking. If you are looking to, check us out at our website, careers.amgens.com. There, there are many, many uh, exciting opportunities. 
That can truly impact human lives. Go check us out. With that, I'll hand it over to my friend here. Thank you so much, Deepak. Um, so I'll cover a bit more on the technical details and uh, some of the specifics of how we went about the journey. So first off, I'm from ZS. Uh, ZS is a professional services firm. Uh, we do strategy, technology, analytics for our clients. And we've been very happy to be Amgen's partner uh, over many years on this journey. So in my section, I'm going to cover a bit on the highlighted pieces that you see on the slide. So I'll talk a bit about the connected data. We'll look at the architecture for that a bit, the enterprise search, the marketplace, the uh, a bit on the DevOps and the maturity um, model that we've created there. So these are sort of the four sections, ways of working. I'll cover uh, DevOps and Agile. Connected data, I'll cover Data Lake Data Fabric, the two platforms on the other side. So let's dive right in. From a ways of working standpoint, when we started this journey, we were no different from what a product organization would go through. Right? You want to ship fast, you want to get in front, get into, get your product in the hands of the customer, fail fast, learn, all of those things. I think we moved from being like a project team approach first to a product and, an, and a scrum team approach. We went through voracious amounts of learning from our retrospectives. But the first part, I think the fascinating part for me is I think that pushed us more towards working in a virtual environment even more than COVID did. Because we were working with agile teams that were California, Florida, India. There was no way for us to collaborate if we weren't virtual first. So it changed the ways of working. We had to go through that transformation ourselves. And now we are at a point where we are working in mature, safe model as a continuous delivery organization uh, across the enterprise. But that's, that's not where the, the, the fun stops, right? Then, for our agile product teams, we had a big goal to advance quite a bit on the DevOps maturity. And we were scratching our heads on, there is no common language. How do we know if a team says they're done on DevOps or they have advanced, how far have they gone? So we actually got together in workshops and put together our own DevOps maturity model. So across several dimensions, we started laying down, what does foundational here mean? What's the bare minimum somebody needs to do? What's a little bit more advanced? What's more, what's more? And every agile product team on our side went through a process of benchmarking where they think they are today. And they all set a goal for themselves on where do they want to be in a year from now. And the success of this model has been, for us, the fact that every year our teams have gotten together to refresh what does this model now look like with the new advances, the new technologies that have come out today, and what should our new benchmarks be? And we're still following that. That's a big part of our product backlog. How do we advance our own DevOps maturity? And the framework informs that for us. At some point, I wish there is a, there is a more open source model of this type of a framework that comes up and becomes a shared common language. But until that, this is the model we're using. The last thing I'll say is, from a ways of working standpoint, the maturity model also informs us continuously on how much advancement we need to do on testing, right? automated testing. And we deal with you know, software code where you can do unit testing very robustly. We deal with data products where automated testing is hard. So we had to overcome some of those pieces. But then there is also uh, dealing with validated environments, which are highly regulated. The regulatory requirements on the type of documentation, the traceability on your testing that you need, that you need to have, pretty significant. So we continuously keep looking for what automation testing can we bring in to address all types of testing that we need to do. And there is a constant push for us to become better and better on that. And that, so we keep looking for new technologies uh, in that area. But all in all, I think the ways of working, it's not as straightforward for us to say, let's work in Agile. There is constant effort going on to figure out how do we become more and more mature on Agile? How do we become a forward-looking organization from a ways of working perspective? The, what that has helped us do is build a number of our platforms very successfully at this point. So I'll cover the connected data platform, uh, the, the, the longest journey that we have been on. Um, I think from a problem statement perspective, nothing different. We all know about all the data engineering work um, that has to happen. The amount of data that exists is exploding. So quite a bit of that, those, those problem statements sort of pushed us into building our architecture here. And I'll jump into a little bit more detail on what we have built. I think this is probably what some of the tech folks in the audience will enjoy. Um, so to read this, we'll go bottom to top. Um, so you've got source systems that are coming in from disparate sources, internal, external, third party, a variety of those. First thing that we did was to build a unified ingestion framework. And we did not want to have different types of pipelines for structured, different types of pipelines for unstructured, and all of that. So there is a unified ingestion framework that has been created that helps us bring data into the lake very easily. Right? 
Now I'll go a little bit on the left. Um, so you see this big box on the platform. Uh, these are all microservices that we have built up. The goal of that was once we build the data lake, we build the unified ingestion, you could bring data very easily into the lake. More and more people wanted to come and build projects that brought data into the lake. And they all wanted to have their own project infrastructure, their own Databricks cluster, their own Airflow, their own S3 buckets and whatnot. So we built a number of these reusable microservices, built a self-service UI on top, and that enabled all our engineers to come in, create a project, bring their own data in, share access with other developers, other people as they needed. All of that became a self-service environment to bring more and more data in. And as Deepak said, that became part of the problem. We were bringing a lot of data into the system. But the, you, the data lake layer wasn't enough for the type of analytics that we wanted to do. The, the need for the classic data warehouse or the lake house, I think that, that was clearly evident that we needed something like that. But it was also evident that we needed to go even further beyond. There was a need to connect data across multiple data warehouses that will likely come up in the organization. We were seeing more and more use cases that were cross-functional, where data cross-functions is needed, and the language that each of the functions uses around that is very different. So there was a big amount, big investment going on in building up a semantic data layer, which is like a data warehouse layer that is connected across. So we have all our data now put into this semantic connected format available in the relational format as well as a knowledge graph format. And all of that is exposed to um, users through a common AWS Glue Metastore, right? And we do a lot of our data security governance and access control from that perspective. And people can use a variety of different tools to come and now access this data. This, this journey is not complete. There is still a lot more data that we have to bring in, a lot more data that we have to connect in the ecosystem, but it is something that we are super excited about. Right? Now, moving forward, uh, the next part of the journey for us was to address the data um, data governance, access, discovery, all those types of things, right? So this is where we built our enterprise marketplace as a, uh, as a solution, and I'll, uh, I'll jump into more details. So the way we thought about this was to think of two personas. You've got the data producers in the company, you've got the data consumers in the company, and there is a need to connect the two, right? And this is where the, the enterprise marketplace as a, uh, as a solution came up. We're again going bottom to top, we had a variety of source systems where data existed. Our goal was not to bring all the data, but we wanted to crawl and get all the metadata from that. So if you registered a new data, data set in one of your data sources, you did not have to actually come into our marketplace and register it. We would have an automated crawler that's going and figuring out new data asset has been generated, and it will bring it in and register it in the system for you. You still have to go and do a lot of the curation associated with that, but this approach of discovering data in an automated format, bringing it into a central registry, um, that, that was a differentiating factor for us. So Solar was our, uh, our data registry, if you will, so all the crawlers would, would pump data into the Solar Index, we were populating that index with additional curation uh, of the information, and we again built a bunch of reusable microservices around that, that power not only the, the indexing and collection and curation of this data, but also a bunch of workflows that will run behind this, so every time somebody comes in, so the, from an access perspective, you come, you're basically coming into a portal. You're searching for whatever data of interest that you have. You'll get to see curated information for that. You can request for access right there. A number of workflows will trigger behind the scenes and will get you access to that data. And this is, this is where one of our metrics, which um, I'm you know, super happy about, is that within our median time for provisioning access to somebody to data is about eight hours. And here we're talking about cases where somebody will actually have to demonstrate proof of training to get access to data. It's not just simply access provisioning, right? So there'll be some at, the, at one end of the spectrum where you request for access, you get it. There are others at the other end of the spectrum where you request for access, you have to show proof of training, and then somebody is actually looking at the proof and approving it. Across that spectrum, less than eight hours, you'll get access to data, right? So all of that is possible because of the sophistication, I think, that's come up in the, from a technology perspective here. But there is, from a, from a user perspective, you can come in here, you've got a data catalog, access to data, search it. You've got data curation. So if you're a data producer or a data SME, you're able to come in there and, and add a lot of metadata associated to, uh, to that. And then all the access management for us is centralized. This marketplace is natively integrated with our uh, connected data ecosystem. So if you have a data set loaded there, it is automatically registered here. If you curate and request access there, you're automatically getting access into the, into the connected data ecosystem. Moving on, 
unstructured data. This is one of our most exciting problem statements that I think we've had to solve for. The concept of dark data, 70% of data is unstructured and hard to access insights from. This part in life sciences is pretty real, where you're dealing with tremendous amount of publications that exist externally, that come in internally. There is a treasure trove of information that exists in, on a variety of different websites that you can subscribe to and get them. A lot of the patient notes that are taken up during claims processing and some of it which is available to pharma, they're all text. There is a vast amount of text information that exists and a variety of different insights that people are interested uh, based on that. So here the goal for us was to introduce a new paradigm for accessing not just the raw data, but insights that you will derive from, that, um, from the unstructured content. Again, from a technology perspective, variety of source systems, internal, external that we are dealing with, same unified ingestion framework that we are, we are able to use for pulling all this data in, crawlers uh, are, are part of that. On the left, again, you'll see a bunch of the reusable services that we had to create there. So a lot of our NLP services, for example, common document processing techniques that you'll have to use, many of those are, are made up into uh, microservices and uh, kept there. But there is also plenty of other stuff that you have to do. Deriving insights from a document is not easy because everybody will write stuff in the document in different ways. So you need to be able to first go into the document, extract text from it, from there figure out the key entities of interest, figure out what are the other ways in which somebody is going to look for that entity. What are the synonyms for that? What is the hierarchy or the ontology associated with the terminology? So a lot of that needs to be done to improve the user experience of what you're looking for gets you to the right document or gets you to the right insight within the document. So a lot of those for us were built um, in this platform, right? And we used our connected data ecosystem to bring the data into the data lake first. And from there, we would have our document processing pipelines that go run a variety of simple you know, text conversion techniques to advanced uh, techniques for summarization, topic modeling, a variety of those types of things to enrich the search index that we are creating here. And this is now plugged into our intranet. Uh, so as soon as you're searching for something for a term, if it exists in this platform from any of the documents, internal or external, that have been brought into the platform, you're taken to, uh, to the document of highest interest. Right? A logical thing that will happen from there is because all of this data is there and connected and searchable, it's a, it's an amazing use case for building virtual assistants or chatbots, right? So that's sort of the next frontier that, uh, that we are on. But beyond that, there is also so much data discovery that can be powered from this type of a platform where all this unstructured information is, uh, is available. Um, that that's, that's a key focus of, a key area of interest for us. That's a key focus where a lot of, um, you know, ongoing innovation and, um, uh, and effort will be uh, spent in. So, from a platform perspective, there is the solar search index that's at the heart of it. There's a lot of automated administration, monitoring type of things. So data observability generally for us is getting built across all our platforms. So each one has their own uh, approach of doing it currently. Uh, we'll keep looking at more tools that can cut across our platforms and help us build uh, better and better observability, right? But that um, covers the story that we were talking about. Deepak shared a bit of the journey. You saw a little bit of the technical details. You can reach us at, uh, at our contact noted here. We'll be happy to take some questions here and we'll be available afterwards to, to address any other questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Really impressive. Uh, John Davies, Chief Data Officer of Totus Medicine. I'm also hiring, by the way. Um, I noticed you said adopting this platform is critical to success. Can you give any really concrete examples of scientists, data scientists, generally in the business, who have now changed the way they've done their decision making and their driving of drug discovery through this? That's one question. And the second is, can you now, with your hand on your heart, say there are no data silos in Amgen R&D anymore? <laughs> so those two questions. What was the second one again, please? Do you have no data silos anymore? <laughs> I wish I could say that, right? But we are, we are on the journey to actually eliminate these no data silos. The first one, uh, more concrete examples of how you know, this is helping our scientists in the research space. So we are actually, uh, as we speak, we are working on a much larger initiative uh, in, in accelerating our drug discovery, right? So 
our connected data ecosystem is what's going to be actually the underlying platform to get all the data on. And the next big one is actually the data science aspect to it. So both of those technologies together are going to help our data scientists start, you know, uh, accelerating and trying some of the methods in the modern molecular discovery and the in silico development models aspect to it. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. You mentioned early on in your slides, uh, you talked about total cost of ownership and that was one of your goals to reduce it. Can you give some concrete examples of where you had savings and what were the drivers behind them? Sure. I'll tell you the most recent one that's actually pretty hot in our uh, plate right now. Uh, just our data engineering costs, right, involves two things, our databricks cost as well as AWS cost when we start putting it all together. It's a pretty big number, right? So one of the, uh, uh, one of the things it comes with, you know, accelerated innovation is we want to accelerate that. We wanted to uh, democratize that innovation as much. In that, there's a phase that for some point we do not want to see the cost, but then we also want to bring that in. So we are, we are, while we're actually accelerating that, while we have the adoption more actively happening in each of the functions, on, a, on the platform side, we also want to actually give that visibility, that cost observability to all our users. So we've implemented methods to uh, have the cost ownership for each of the cost centers, have those cost owners you know, take a look at what they are actually paying the bill at the end of the day, right? kind of push that uh, uh, shared accountability between what the enterprise owns, what each of the application owners owns, the trying to strike the right balance between those. Hopefully that answers your question. Great talk, guys. That phenomenal, right? Uh, the biology from. Can can you speak without mask, please? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, hey, guys. Phenomenal talk. This is biology from Gainwell Technologies. Um, I had a quick question for you. Yeah, uh, you know, you're you're essentially running an enterprise IT initiative, right? And you talked, you, know, you addressed adoption a little bit, but I want to ask you to speak a little bit more about the training aspects that 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 you put in place to drive adoption among the various business units that you're aggregating data from. If I understand the question, you're saying you want us to speak to a little bit more on how we drove the adoption. Did I catch that right, Balaji? Yep, and, and, and you talked about how you had, like, I think Vicky alluded to that, about how you had training in place to um, allow people to provision data from your data lake now. Yeah, and so how do you training. implement and drive that adoption? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the shared operating model is the key for enterprise, right? So this is what I was highlighting in the pain points. It's easy to get stuck in the engineering trap, right? We actually heard the, I mean, learned that the hard way, what uh, actually one of our architects used to call it feature trap, right? We're dominated by engineering staff, and in my opinion, it's very easy to excite engineers, right? You give a piece of technology and uh, they go crazy and start building stuff. Right? <laughs> But when you look at the adoption of it, that's where it doesn't resonate. So along the way, we started realizing we're building all these, what we think are you know, cool stuff, but it's not being adopted. So we started measuring our user adoption, right? So we turned the table around a little bit. We figured out, you know, we, we, we are, and this is a journey, right? This is not solve it once and it's done. So uh, focusing on the adoption metrics is one important thing. User engagement is another thing. So we, one of the statements I made is we now operate as a, as a product organization. What I mean by that is we have structured engagements with all our uh, uh, users. We run a product advisory board with our, with our stakeholders across the board. Constantly we, keep, we go back and they multi, that's, one, that's just one example of engagement. We hear from them, we ask them what, what is the problem you want to solve, right? That's the other one. The third thing is also a top down, right? We actually integrated our you know, processes, our engagement methods into you know, where the money is. So before a project gets funded, right, you know, things always follow the money. So that's another vehicle that you know, the leadership got an alignment on, got in. So there are multiple ways to do that, right? Uh, if there's one thing I would highlight, you know, actively listening to the users, right? Active engagement and you know, having that and building it meaningful uh, you know, value delivery. Focusing on that value delivery, I think, is the key and that's a continuous aspect to it. Vicky, right. anything you want to add there? No, I think we're out of time, so uh, we'll chat more later after the talk if anybody wants to come over. Uh, we'll be hanging out outside hanging out if you want to chat. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you.